and Jeff McAllister, who's an American writer and commentator. Now, Donald Trump, the self-described great deal-maker, whose ghost-written biography was The Art of the Deal, has failed to convince even Republicans in Congress that he knows what he's doing on health care. In what polls say is the most unpopular presidency ever at this stage, can he convince Americans he knows what he's doing on anything else? How much trouble is he in, do you think? He starts in trouble because he is unpopular. It was an election in which Hillary Clinton won by three million popular votes. And he did come in saying health care was easy. Republicans that I've run brought with me can do this because we've been saying for seven years that we could do health care better quickly. Uh, it turns out that their health care ideas can't even pass their own caucus. They were unworkable. Uh, he's not a deal maker. He thought he could do his fairy dust thing. It didn't work. He disappoints his base. It makes him look incompetent. Uh, it is a mess now. Uh, does it give him a chance to pivot? It's interesting because in many ways he's not a Republican. He is not a classic small government Republican. This was really Paul Ryan's health care bill. Trump probably never read it and doesn't know most of the contents. Um, Paul Ryan being the Speaker, the speaker of, the of the House. House. So, no. And all those Republicans, the, the, the Freedom Caucus, the very right wing, that's not Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a nationalist. He believes in infrastructure. He was pro-choice before he was anti-choice because he needed it for the Republican vote. I always thought he had an opportunity to pivot to the center and to go with Democrats. He could get Democrat votes on uh, taxes and on infrastructure and on lots of things if he wanted to. But most of the people around him are so right wing. And Steve Bannon, his chief strategist, is uh, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's talk that he actually wanted this outcome on health care mm. because he hates Paul Ryan so badly <laughs> and has hated him for so long. But now he's neutered the Republicans in Washington and leaving tr Trump triumphant. So, but as, so you, as you both know, I, that was a bit I didn't get. Why, why would Obamacare necessarily collapse unless Congress denies funding in well, some way? It, the, the difficulty is that it's a, this funny hybrid of a government program and an insurance market, which was uh, actually an idea put forward by the Heritage Foundation Republican uh, think yeah, tank in 1992. Think tank, yeah. It's a very markety Republican idea to begin with. Hmm. And it, but it requires insurance companies to set premiums and then get subsidies from the government. And so in some states and some markets, some insurance companies have pulled out yeah. because they don't like the particular risk pools that they've got. And so in some states, I mean, for the first two years, pr premiums actually went down. This now year, they went up to, by 22 percent on average. In some markets, 100 percent. And then if they go up so far, then people don't sign up, and the young people who are healthy don't sign up, and then you know the yeah, rates don't guess, work anymore. Yeah. But if the government wants but, to solve this, but it's sick a people who need health care is the, is it's, the, it's, the it's, obvious. It's not that hard to do. I mean, we have made health care much more complicated in America but, than we need to. And I, I, actually, I just this is an important point mm -hmm. about Trump. The, the problem is, in the Reagan days, the Republicans believed in smaller government, but they believed in, you know, doing things and making government work. Richard Nixon imposed wage and price controls. I mean, it's, they, were, they believed that the government had important things to do. The people in the, in the House Republican Party, the, the guts of the Republican Party now, is so anti-government that they can't figure out how to make it work. Do you think there could be a foreign policy crisis that someone will manufacture, and it may be actually someone in the White House? Uh, I... You know, wagging the dog is always possible. I think when you actually get to making war on other countries, the sober people do tend to show up at the table. And the, and the president himself, even one as feckless and as strange, really, as mm -hmm. this man is, uh, will uh, get the picture that he's not supposed to be ordering people into to their deaths without some good reason. But, but will Putin figure? Why not? I mean, there's lots of opportunities to do funny things in Ukraine and uh, to take advantage on the edges, which I think will tie him in knots. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> the security services in Britain and the United States have advised that laptops and similar devices should no longer be allowed on certain flights to counter the threat from sophisticated bombs. But in London this week, as we've seen in France and Germany and elsewhere in the past year, low-tech terror is also deadly and difficult to prevent. What, if anything, can be done? Yeah, I think sang froid is really the only way. Uh, <laughs> As we to, British to, say. Yeah, exactly. Um, because the purpose of terrorism is to terrorize. And yes. if you're not terrified, uh, it makes a big difference. I mean, if you look at how people really die in the world, more mm. to toddlers killed more people in America last year through handguns yeah. left on their parents' mm. table mm. than terrorists did. 
but we don't get rid of toddlers. Um, I mean, there are 2,000 people killed in road accidents every year in Britain, and now the number is going up for the first time after many years of decline because of better design and anti-drunk driving campaigns because people are using their mobile phones while they're driving. Are we going to get rid of mobile phones? No, you figure out a solution to the problem. In this way, you know, better policing, better security work, it's yeah. the only way to go. Otherwise, we do give up our society.